Welcome everyone, and I hope you didn't have too much trouble getting connected. The Zoom webinar is down for everybody in the world, um, and so we're actually quite lucky to be here. So I'd like to welcome everyone today um, to the Water Management and Water Quality webinar. This webinar is the sixth one in a series of nine webinars on soil health and organic farming, organized by the Organic Farming Research Foundation and eOrganic with funding from the Clarence Heller Foundation. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic, and eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them by typing webinars by eOrganic into a search engine, and you can also find the recording on the eOrganic YouTube channel of all the past webinars, and this webinar will be there as well because we are recording it, and we should have the recording available within one to two weeks. This webinar will last about 45 minutes to an hour, and when it's over, we'll have have 30 minutes for questions. And I'd like to welcome our presenter today, Mark Schoenbeck. I'd like to welcome him back. He's been doing all the webinars in this series. And Mark is a research associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation. He has worked for 31 years as a researcher, consultant, and educator in sustainable and organic agriculture. And he has also edited the newsletter and been very active in the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. So, uh the Organic Farming Research Foundation conducted a survey of over 1,400 organic farmers, that's a number of respondents, across the country to identify their priorities for research into organic agriculture. And nearly three quarters of them considered soil health as a high research priority. It was the leading uh, overarching topic. And <clears throat> relevant to this webinar is the fact that a significant number, 34%, cited climate change impacts on production. And in the Western region, it was most often worries about drought, which are getting, getting more intense. In all the other regions, uh, the biggest concerns are around times of excessive rainfall. That's the Northeast, the North Central, and the Southern regions have all experienced uh, excessive rainfalls. So uh, obviously you have to have water to produce crops. And so water quantity, um, is a big issue, especially when it doesn't rain or it doesn't stop raining. And uh, those are in fact leading causes of crop loss and of crop insurance claims. And so irrigation is essential for all crops when you're really in really dry regions. And when you're growing specialty crops, even if you're in a region that's considered high rainfall, 30, 40, 50 inches a year, you will need to have access to irrigation um, in order to get over those dry spells because these specialty crops, the, the yield loss in response to a relatively short hiatus in rain can be pretty serious. And unfortunately, the climate changes that we're experiencing uh, will be intensifying uh, droughts and floods both. And <clears throat> one thing that's really clear, it's been clear since the uh, beginning of the organic movement is that organic farmers depend on really good soil, really healthy soil to sustain crops through times of excess or deficient moisture. Next. And anytime you're producing crops, uh, you are potentially affecting water quality. Any nutrient source, uh, both organic and but especially uh, non-organic, which are more soluble, can uh, pollute water with uh, nutrients through runoff and leaching. Um, when you're using manure, uh, there's always a pathogen issue. And anytime soil erodes, there could be sediment to the, to the waters. And of course, in turn, water quality, uh, whatever water is being used for irrigation will impact crops. Uh, groundwater can be saline, it can be rich in sodium or other cations uh, or alkaline. All of these will affect the crop and soil health itself. And as we unfortunately know from experiences uh, in parts of the Southwest with salad crops, uh, irrigation water can bring in pathogens and create food safety problems. Next. Okay, so one thing to remember is if, uh, depending upon the kind of region you're in, uh, there are two broad categories of water quality concerns. One is uh, nutrients from agricultural soils leaching down through the soil profile into the groundwater. And on the other hand is soluble salts, other, which are often naturally occurring, moving up towards the surface. So in general, if you're in a, in a moist climate like my hometown of Floyd in Virginia, you get 45 inches of rain every year, the big concern is the leaching because we have more rainfall than evaporation 
Um, when I say evaporation, I actually mean technically evapotranspiration, which is everything the plants give off plus whatever's uh, evaporated directly from the soil surface. <clears throat> um, now I'm uh, taking an example from Montana. It's actually uh, where one of the world's most uh, excellently managed organic farms, Villicus Farms, Doug and Anna Crabtree grow dryland grains. They get 11 inches of rain per year. And in that region, um, evaporation is considerably greater than rainfall. So soil moisture tends to move up as there can be an issue of soil salts accumulating at the surface. Um, this is a dryland uh, farm. They are not using irrigation water, so they will not be needing to be concerned with adding additional salts in that way. Uh, but these are the two different uh, broad climate related scenarios with water quality. Okay, next. And uh, we'll just quickly talk a little bit about how soil moisture behaves and the effects of the soil's inherent properties, what, uh, what nature has given the farmer on how water will behave in the profile. Next. <clears throat> so what happens in the, in the soil when it rains or when you turn on the irrigation? Uh, the first thing that happened is that uh, the pores fill up completely with water and then you have a wetting front that moves down through the soil as more and more rain uh, falls on the surface. And then um, after the rain finishes or if the rain is coming down gently enough, gravity will remove the excess water from the largest pores and they again become air filled. Whereas the so-called capillary pores, which are smaller, uh, retain water that is available to crops. And then there's an extremely small pore size uh, that holds what is sometimes called hygroscopic water. It, it just think of it as water that's held so tightly by the soil that plants cannot extract it. And uh, we'll see a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, okay, so next. So in a typical loamy soil uh, that's at field capacity, and what field capacity is, is the state of the soil right after a rain event has completely filled all of the pores and then the excess has drained out of the large pores. So the soil is both moist and well aerated. Uh, what's called gravitational water has moved down through the soil profile, either to the subsoil or to the uh, water table. <clears throat> so a percentage of the water held by the soil at this point, um, usually half, a little more than half, hopefully, um, is what's called plant available water, or and that's considered the water holding capacity as far as uh, crop production is concerned. And then you have those all important air filled macro pores that allow the roots and the soil organisms to breathe. Uh, they do; they are aerobic. They need air as well as water. Uh, and then in any soil, uh, there is that small amount of water that you could drive off if you threw the soil into an oven at, at the boiling point of water, but the plants can't get because it's held too tightly. Uh, next. So um, inherent soil properties are, are, are what nature gave you. These are the properties that you'll learn about by looking up your soil, looking up your field position on the NRCS web soil survey. Um, things like soil texture, the proportion of sand, silt, and clay, uh, the soil depth, how deep it is to either the uh, bedrock or um, other parent material or to a water table. Uh, and the profile, the quality of the layers, the topsoil, which is where all your biological activity is and it's high organic matter, and then various subsoil layers. Uh, the B horizon is a general term for that next layer down. It's still soil, but it isn't the same, quite the same uh, biological activity and uh, qualities as the topsoil. And then there's issues of drainage and permeability. How well does it drain out to get to that ideal field capacity? and how deep roots can go before they hit a layer that prevents them from growing deeper. Next. <clears throat> so um, if we look at a sandy soil uh, versus a clay soil, um, you will see uh, different water relations. The sandy soil tends to have a lot of large pores and they drain out quickly. And its water holding capacity is relatively small and um, the amount of unavailable water is very small because that's mostly associated with clays. So in the clay soil, the solids actually occupy a somewhat smaller percentage of the volume, but there's quite a bit more both water holding capacity and um, tightly bound water. Now what's actually available to the plant is a function of two factors. One is how big that 
WHC, that water holding capacity uh, slice of the pie chart is times how deep can the roots go? So if you had a loamy soil um, that had a 20%, if that, w, if that water holding capacity uh, uh, slice is 20% of the pie, 20% of the volume, and plant roots can just go down to five feet before they hit bedrock or other unfavorable conditions, that means that the crop will have a whole 12 inches of moisture available to it when that whole profile is at field capacity. Whereas if you have a sandy soil that has only 15% water holding capacity and there is a very severe hard pan at 18 inch depth, um, or at, let's say at a, at a foot depth, then the plants will only have 1.8 inches of moisture. So there's a huge difference there. And that can be entirely inherent properties uh, that are not easily modified by management. Next. <clears throat> So just an example here in the southeastern United States, some of the coastal plain soils, um, all of our soils in the southeast, nearly all of them are also soils, which is just the order of soils that are highly weathered. And they're often considered, oh, they're not very fertile. And the issue is not so much that they're not fertile, but that two aspects of fertility, uh, mineral reserves and biological activity are separated in space because over the millennia, um, the high rainfall, warm weather uh, climates of this region have moved a lot of the clays out of the topsoil, out of that A horizon, down into a, a horizon called the B horizon. So you have more moisture holding capacity with a, with a higher clay content. You have a number of nutrients that tend to uh, be held there rather than in the topsoil. But some of these soils also have a zone of soil that's leached out. The clays are gone, but it's deep enough in the profile that you don't have the biological activity. This is called an E horizon. And they are quite, can be quite prone to compaction. They may even be naturally somewhat compacted. So you get a situation where the plant roots can't get down to all those wonderful reserves of moisture and nutrients and are restricted to the A horizon. So they're much more prone to drought. Uh, one of the interesting things about this challenge, uh, this kind of uh, soil challenge, is that in the winter time, when the soil profile is close to field capacity, it has not dried down, um, robust cover crops can get through that E horizon. And when they do so, they allow subsequent cash crops to do likewise. And we'll see a little bit more, a specific example of that later on. Uh, next. <clears throat> So we'll talk a little bit about how soil health um, influences water availability and water quality. So these are dynamic soil properties that are responsive to management. Okay, next, so go back to another diagram. So let's see what happens in a really healthy soil. This is a fairly loamy soil, medium texture, balanced amounts of sand, silt, and clay. And it has been taken really good care of either by nature or by a, a very good organic farmer. Uh, very experienced. So the whole soil profile is open. There are no hard pans. The, the surface is very crumbly. The uh, pore structure is open so that when the rain comes, it soaks in. It doesn't pond up and run off, doesn't compact the surface. And all the way through the profile, there's a very substantial water holding capacity so that um, that whole profile remains both well aerated and um, fairly rich in available moisture. And, as a, and because it has a very deep open profile, the, the plant can send its roots as deep as it needs to get the moisture uh, that it needs. And at the same time, if you do really have an excessive rain, if it rains seven inches in, in two days, of course, it'll be more than the best soil profile can hold. And if it is well drained, it will actually just move down into the groundwater. Next. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, here's a few of the aspects of healthy soils that contribute to that water holding capacity. Soil organic matter itself, each ton of um, soil organic matter has been estimated at about six tons of water holding capacity. Uh, so when you increase your organic matter from let's say 2% by uh, weight to 3% by weight, uh, you've, added, um, you've added 10 tons of organic matter, which would mean 60 tons more moisture, which is uh, quite a bit, makes quite a difference. And with that open network of pores, then uh, the water gets in easily when, you, when it rains or you overhead irrigate. 
um, and the good aggregation that's maintained by the living plants and uh, the soil life uh, maintains that high uh, water holding capacity and good drainage. And it's all based on biological activity. Uh, and good biodiversity is important. That uh, If you have a, a diverse crop rotation and soil food web, uh, these properties are enhanced further. Okay, next. <clears throat> so what happens, you, get, you got a compacted soil. Uh, soil compaction can happen in several ways. One, you can have a surface crust. Um, anytime, even a healthy soil, if you leave it bare too much and too many heavy rainfalls pound the surface, you will eventually disperse the aggregates right at the surface and you'll get the clays and the silt sealing off the surface somewhat. So instead of falling onto a sponge, the rain is more like, seems almost like it's falling on a plastic mulch and a lot of it runs off. So you don't get as much into the soil profile. Another issue that can happen if you have subsurface compaction, a plow pan, a tillage pan, or in some cases a naturally occurring hard pan, as I mentioned earlier, that means uh, that even if the water can eventually get through that hard pan, very often the roots cannot. They cannot physically push through that hard layer. Um, so that reduces both the depth that the uh, crop accesses and it also reduces um, the uh, size of that water holding capacity as a proportion of the, uh, of the soil uh, volume. Another thing that can happen in compacted soils, they're more prone to water logging uh, even if there's a moderate hard pan enough to slow down roots, it will slow down water penetration as well. So you'll have a longer period after a heavy rain that the soil is saturated. And that creates anaerobic conditions or hypoxic conditions, which are stressful to both plant roots and soil life. Okay, next. So um, you can have soils that are not compacted. They're really well drained, but they're kind of depleted. They haven't had enough organic inputs, not enough living plant roots in them over the years. So their soil life and organic matter reserves are, are depressed. And very often sandy soils, very sandy soils will naturally tend to be somewhat like what you see here. The plant roots can get down deep enough, but when the rain comes, and it soaks in, there's not enough organic matter and uh, large pore space in the soil, capillary pore space to absorb and hold that water. So it's more like a sieve than a sponge. And uh, these soils are often called droughty because uh, plants will quickly um, show water stress because of the lower water holding capacity. Now, having said that, in this picture, you have, at least you have a uh, good uh, drainage, you don't have a compaction layer. If you have both compaction layer and uh, sandy low water holding capacity soil, then you have a really droughty situation. Um, and it is partly a matter of inherent properties and partly uh, management related. So you, in that situation, you'll have to do the best you can to manage for improved soil health. Next. And moisture extremes will affect soil health itself. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, when you have too much moisture, uh, you'll have um, a de decreased amount of oxygen available to the soil organisms and the plant roots. And in severe conditions, that can actually become so anaerobic that the soil starts releasing methane. Uh, when it's less severe, you will have still have an increase in nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, I say here, it kills aerobic soil mi microbes. Now, if you have prolonged ponding and water logging. That will occur a short period of water log conditions, which can happen anywhere during some of our more extreme rainfalls, will simply make these organisms go dormant. They'll just kind of wait it out. Um, and the longer it is, the more risk there is of damage or disease to plant roots. Um, and the picture, the lower picture on the right there, that's yellow nutshells. That's a weed that quite thrives in wet soil. So when you have uh, a tendency towards excessive wetness, uh, you will also see an increase in those weeds. Another thing that happens, uh, the water logging itself uh, does, uh, especially if there's repeated heavy rains, it, it can tend to increase the surface crusting. And of course, the heavy rainfalls on sloping land will, will uh, increase the risk of erosion. Next. So, uh, the other extreme, what happens when it doesn't rain enough for a long time? Well, when it's dry, 
most of these organisms are quite capable of going dormant, but they're not doing anything. They're just sort of going dormant. Their populations may diminish. They're in a spore form. Um, plant growth, of course, slows and stops. And when plant growth stops, then the uh, pipeline of the primary source of food for soil life basically stops. That's the root exudase. The plant's not photosynthesizing and growing. It's no longer actively providing that fresh uh, microbial food. And uh, during a prolonged drought, you have less biomass production, so you have less organic return to the soil through the crop rotation. And <clears throat> if the soil surface is exposed during a dry period, you have a great risk of uh, wind erosion and perhaps fire as well. Um, now, one thing that's interesting about fire, it's a double-edged sword. There is some evidence that naturally occurring prairie fires in uh, prairie environments where kind of moderately low rainfall um, so there is some evidence that those basically create biochar in situ. So if they're not excessively hot and destructive, um, they will actually in the long term build the soil's organic matter and capacity to hold moisture. Um, although of course, you wanna be very careful of managing fire. There is prescribed burning, which can have the same effect when done properly. Um, organic rules do very much restrict the circumstances under which this practice may be uh, done. So I would say if, if you're a certified organic farmer and thinking of using that for any reason, definitely check with your certifier. Um, one double whammy that can happen is if you have a wet spell, it's so wet that the crop roots don't go very deep because there's too much, uh, the water table is too close to the surface. Uh, and then suddenly you swing towards drought. Uh, that sharp wetting to drying firstly will intensify compaction and also uh, leave the crop unprepared for the dryness. Whereas if, this, if the soil, when the weather dry out very gradually and the soil is healthy, the roots will go deeper and deeper. Okay. So co-managing water and soil resources. Uh, just some practical steps here. Let's look at the next slide. I always like to start with the uh, four principles of soil health management that the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, developed because uh, the research that I reviewed, a lot of it conducted through the Organic Research and Extension Initiative and the Organic Transitions Program, all of the soil health research that I've seen basically supports these four principles. One is keeping the soil covered. Obviously, um, exposed soil is, is prone to getting crusted and eroded. Um, and keeping that coverage there maintains the open pores at the surface and enhances infiltration. Uh, living roots are vital uh, because it's, a, it's that day, it's the day-to-day -day source of um, food for the organic, uh, for the uh, soil life. And soil life feeding on root exudates and on fine root sloughing and turning that over into active and then stable organic matter, that is what builds and creates the organic matter and the water holding capacity, all that, all that uh, capillary pore space that uh, holds water for the crops. Diversifying your crops um, has a couple of effects related to water use and water management. One is if you're alternating deep and shallow rooted crops or mixing them and crops with different uh, root architectures, different degrees of lateral spread, you're balancing your demands on soil water. Whereas if you grow nothing but very deep rooted crops or nothing but very shallow rooted crops of a certain uh, root form uh, uh, morphology, you will deplete certain uh, uh, layers, certain horizons in the soil profile and, and not fully utilize the moisture elsewhere. Uh, that's especially true if you don't have any deep rooted crops in your, in your rotation. You're just leaving the water and nutrients um, well below the surface. It'll eventually just leach down to the groundwater. The other thing is the more diverse your crop rotation, uh, the happier and more diverse and balanced the soil life. And again, that will uh, repay and increase water holding capacity. Minimizing disturbance, uh, especially important around physical disturbance. This is a big challenge for organic growers because we really have to do some tillage some of the time to deal with the weeds and maybe to prepare a seed bed after a heavy cover crop. Um, but the more you can minimize that and more you can choose uh, tillage tools that are appropriate to the conditions and will do the least damage to soil structure, the more you'll protect your water holding capacity. Next. So we'll just look at some basic organic health, soil health practices and how they relate to water management. Uh, crop rotation and cover crops. Uh, again, the living plant is 
uh, really the ultimate source, uh, number one ultimate source of or soil organic matter and uh, thriving soil life. Um, and compost is a good material that it adds a lot of stable organic matter and it can restore uh, certain populations of desirable soil organisms um, and therefore it can contribute to water holding capacity. Uh, surface mulch conserves moisture and prevents crusting. Um, and whenever you reduce tillage, as I mentioned before, you're protecting the soil, uh, the pore structure and the surface uh, opening to the surface, et cetera. Uh, this example at the right here is a squash crop growing in roll crimped um, uh, vetch and rye. Um, the fact that that was no tilled, uh, that that cover crop was managed without tillage and left a large biomass of roots intact in the profile um, enhances uh, soil water relations, both drainage and watering holding capacity. And the mulch is just like any organic mulch. The nice thing about organic mulches, especially ones like hay and straw and, and ones of similar texture, is they act like a one-way valve. The rain comes down, uh, the force of the raindrop is, is, uh, dis um, is dispersed so that you have a very gentle impact on the soil surface, keep the pores open, but it lets the moisture in, it goes into the soil, and then, be, and then that mulch acts as a barrier to slow evaporative losses. Um, next. Uh, so another uh, a nutrient management is really important for protecting water quality. And it turns out that excesses of nitrogen and phosphorus not only uh, threaten water quality by runoff and leaching, but they also depress the activity of certain parts of the soil life or soil food web. And uh, that can in turn result in less favorable soil moisture relations, uh, water holding capacity. One thing that can happen is if your soil phosphorus gets very high, the mycorrhizae go to sleep. And mycorrhizae basically double or triple the effective root system of many crops, any crop that's considered a strong host of mycorrhizae. When they have that association in place, their capacity to absorb moisture is greatly increased and it's, it greatly increases drought resilience of, of crops and pasture to have active mycorrhizal activity. Uh, one of the great things about organic systems, we don't use synthetics and um, although opinions differ as to how much uh, synthetic pesticides, herbicides and fungicides impact soil life, there are certainly likely to be some adverse impacts. Uh, staying away from them and staying away from um, synthetic fertilizers will protect the soil life from those impacts. Uh, management intensive rotational grazing is an extremely valuable practice. Uh, <clears throat> some of the most dramatic improvements in soil health, soil organic matter, uh, both drainage and water holding capacity and pasture resilience during drought have resulted from switching from uh, low uh, unmanaged or poorly managed grazing to a uh, management intensive rotational grazing where the livestock are um, grazed on a particular area intensively for one or two days and then moved off it. And that uh, recently grazed paddock is allowed to recover fully over uh, several weeks to several months. And that short intense grazing followed by full recovery um, encourages the, uh, the forage, the, the, the pasture, whatever the sod is, grass, legumes, forbs, to uh, build soil through uh, deep rooting followed by the root sloughing upon the grazing. Um, and then there's a cycling of nutrients from the animals. Um, whereas if it's just sort of randomly grazed continuously at a low intensity, uh, you actually have a loss of the depth of that uh, active root growth. And um, so this is one area that, that organic and other conservation agriculture approaches can really um, help with, with soil water relations. Okay, here's an example from a long-term, uh, next, next slide, please. <clears throat> this is the Rodale Long-Term Farming Systems Trial. And this is a picture of a cornfield during a fairly severe drought. Uh, I think it was in 1995, but uh, the one on the left is one of the organically managed rotations uh, where uh, fertility has been managed with cover crops and a little bit of manure. And on the right is conventionally managed rotation. And you can see the effects of the greater soil health on the left. 
Um, they also documented that the infiltration of moisture into the soil on the organic system was about 15 to 20 percent greater than in the conventional system, which means that there was less runoff, less potential for erosion every time there was a heavy rain. But even that relatively small sounding amount of 15 to 20 percent resulted in far better crop condition and about a 30 percent improvement in yields compared to the conventional system. Now, in years of adequate rainfall, organic and conventional yielded similarly, or sometimes even the conventional was just a little bit higher. But what you see here is a great increase in yield stability. You get a dry year, your organically managed soil uh, brought in a good crop. Next. That brings us up to the, the, big, climate, uh, the big issue that's on everybody's mind these days, uh, climate change. And how does it affect water and soil health? Uh, we will be facing both more frequent droughts and really torrential rains. And uh, one survey of farmers in, uh, was conducted in New York, was very interesting. They conducted one survey after a bad drought year and one after a flood year, just to get an idea of what their viewpoint of, of the soil health challenges related to the weather extremes and how they would respond to it. And the interesting thing is, uh, a greater percentage of far farmers said, well, I need to improve soil health and build soil organic matter to be prepared for the next drought, compared to ones who said, I better install some irrigation. <clears throat> and then the next year when the floods came, although only a few uh, small percentage said they were actually gonna try to change practices as a result of their experience of the flood, a lot of them believed that the uh, soil health practices they already utilize, such as cover crops and good sound rotation, um, et cetera, reduce tillage, improve the resilience to floods. And as I, um, this is the next slide is an example right close to home. This is like within a half a quarter mile of my uh, front doorstep. Um, our small river, it's called the Little River, the West Fork of the Little River. One day in September of uh, 2015, we had seven inches of rain and that came on top of another seven inches in the preceding week. So we had the greatest flood that I'd ever seen. Now what, fortunately, after we dug our potatoes, um, one of my community mates here, my next door neighbor, immediately planted the cover crop and planted sorghum sedan. It grew up nice and thick. It's about three, four feet tall. The floods came, pushed the fence over, drowned that potato field in three feet of rushing water. And when it receded, we had a naturally roll crimped cover crop and we did not lose a single shovel full of soil. Had we failed to plant that cover crop, um, I would not be surprised if there had been a three foot deep gully there. And not only did the cover crop save the soil physically from being removed, but uh, being a very heavy deep rooted crop, it probably accelerated the rate at which that soil recovered from the brief anaerobic condition caused by that flood. In fact, that crop is not dead. It, it uh, bounced back up and started growing and, and uh, grew until frost. Uh, next. So cover crops enhance water availability and water quality in a number of ways. Uh, just as you saw there, preventing erosion, uh, they reduce runoff. Uh, you, you can imagine a heavy rain falling into that crop there. Same thing would probably happen. The worst would be as it would fall over, but it would hold all that moisture. It's constantly feeding the organisms and maintaining the pore structure. Um, and if you have deep rooted species in the cover crops, especially something like tillage radish that leaves a great big pore, it'll ensure that water uh, infiltrates in and then drains well. Um, heavy cover crops absorb excess nutrients and protect water quality. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they have a, pot a potential to penetrate subsurface hard pan, uh, therefore correcting uh, water limitations. And when you have those combination of uh, benefits, it'll actually enhance the ability of the following crop to access moisture reserves, especially in the subsoil. And here's a specific example, again, uh, from the Southeastern region. Um, uh, this is some, a study that was done in South Carolina on some coastal plains um, uh, by uh, Marshall et al. There's the reference at the bottom and uh, the more details on this in the uh, presentation notes that will be posted along with the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint slides. Uh, but basically what they did is they, they uh, took three very sandy soils. One of them is simply called a sand, which is like extremely sandy. It's hardly any silt or clay at all. 
Uh, but the other two were a loamy sand and another one a, a sandy loam. Um, the latter two soils um, had enough fertility to grow really good winter cry, rye cover crops, one to two tons per acre, maybe three tons per acre. And just doing that for two years increased the organic matter in the, uh, by about half a percentage uh, point, which is quite, um, quite impressive. It just shows that those soils were depleted and they were just, uh, the soil life is just ready to make the best of those cover crops. Another thing that happened is the water holding capacity in the top 18 inches increased by one to one and a half inches. Um, and the rye uh, be growing in the winter when the soil was moist, it was able to get to that somewhat compacted E horizon, which was present in all of these soils, open it up so that no-till cotton could grow down into the subsoil, access all that moisture and nutrients. And for no-till cotton, that improved yields 38%. Now you can deal with this another way. You can go in there with a deep ripper and open up that hard pen and get cotton yields uh, the same as with the cover crop. Uh, but then you have some of the adverse effects of tillage and you burn up all that extra fuel. It's, it's a lot to pull a deep, deep ripper through an E horizon. And uh, so that was a very interesting study. This is not even uh, one of the most powerful subsoil or crops. Let's go to the next slide. Um, there are studies that show that radish is a much um, more aggressive subsoil and crop even than rye. Uh, on the left here, you see the, uh, the left-hand picture is a, a radish canopy that is closed. So it's probably about 60 days after planting in the late fall. Um, and on the right, there's a root that's going, and you can see it going down through it. Uh, looks like it might be going down through an E horizon right into the B. And uh, studies in the, in the uh, uh, north central region have shown that when you grow a, rye, a radish cover crop, not only does that radish mop up all the soluble nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium down to five feet and then return it to the next crop, but the next crop, the corn and the soybean can send its roots much deeper. So you get a two or three or four week dry spell and uh, it'll have access to those deep reserves. Next slide. So here's some, a couple of my favorite cover crops, uh, pearl millet and sorghum sudan grass. These are uh, warm season annual grasses and uh, one of the properties that they have is they have a root system that's both deep and fibrous. And the fibrous root system, um, it just kind of goes through all of the soil, uh, all of the macropores and reaches all parts of the soil, supporting soil life uh, right in the rhizosphere. So it's like it's, it's building that crumb structure. And the fact that it's deep, it goes down in through those uh, potentially compacted uh, horizons down into the subsoil. And if you grow these crops to about a three or four foot height and before they start showing signs of heading and you mow them once and then let them grow again, during that regrowth, the root system goes even deeper and, and gets even denser. And uh, the studies have verified that uh, pearl millet can basically deplete soil nitrate down to a depth of five feet. Uh, and although the deplete word there maybe sound kind of negative, it's much better to scavenge all that subsoil nitrogen and turn it into biomass and to have it go down into the water table and slightly affect drinking water downstream. And meanwhile, you gotta spend more on fertilizer. So these have uh, multiple uh, valuable functions, but one of them is uh, keeping that soil profile open uh, for subsequent crops. Another neat thing about pearl millet is that even though it's deep rooted, its drought tolerance is also based on the fact that it's very moisture efficient. It does not use huge amounts of moisture to grow its biomass. Uh, let's look at the next slide. Um, one thing to remember about cover crops, I've been singing their praises for five, 10 minutes now. They are a very vigorous plant and what do plants do? They transpire. So they're taking moisture out of the soil while they're putting on all that wonderful biomass and feeding the soil life. And um, so if you're having a wet year, like you're having one of those excessive rainfall years that we seem to complain about in the Eastern two thirds of the country, that's great because you've got a big heavy cover crop out there sucking all that moisture out, you can get in the field faster. On the other hand, if you're having a drought year or you're in a low rainfall region, semi-arid uh, dryland wheat, that can be a major problem. You can use up the moisture so that your next crop is planted in dry soil, can hardly come up. Um, so you have this very interesting paradox that uh, in the long run, cover crops in any environment will be improving the soil's capacity to hold moisture, its resilience, 
um, all of those uh, physical um, properties related to soil health that I've been talking about. And in fact, if you look at the dry land wheat area, they get 10, 15 inches of rain a year. The classical traditional rotation is a, a wheat crop followed by a whole year of fallow. And the idea of the fallow is to absorb another year's worth of rain, get an extra 10 inches stored up in the soil profile. And on the one hand, this works to the extent that if you grow wheat after fallow, you'll get a higher yield than wheat after wheat or wheat after alfalfa or wheat after sorghum sudan, anything that uses a lot of water. But in the long run, you're degrading soil organic matter and you're reducing the water holding capacity of that soil profile. Uh, you're running down the soil life. Uh, the soil doesn't, life doesn't have anything to eat during that whole year of fallow, so it's not there regenerating soil structure and, and uh, pore space. So what are you gonna do? Well, I just want to point out that Doug and Anna Crabtree of Villicus Farms in northern Montana, they farm on an average of 11 inches of water a year. Um, an extreme drought year can go down as low as two or three inches. They developed a rotation uh, cropping system that includes 15 production crops and 10 cover crops. They don't have fallow years. Uh, they choose their crops carefully to balance the short-term moisture use issue with the long-term soil health improvement. They've had a substantial increase in their soil organic matter. They're producing not only uh, dry land organic wheat, but specialty grains like spelt and uh, Corazon wheat and um, others, barley. They're producing oil seeds and uh, various pulses like uh, lentils and peas. And all of these crops are working together to improve the water holding capacity of their soil. Now, if you get an extreme year like uh, 2017, where only rain two inches, two and a half inches, it's pretty rough to produce anything, but the resilience is much greater uh, than in a wheat fallow rotation. Next. <clears throat> so here's an interesting uh, thing to remember. Um, I learned this from a, a, a publication on, uh, by USDA showing different cover crops and whether they're low, medium, or high uh, water use. And all of these cover crops that I list here are fairly much drought tolerant. They're known for their capacity to stay alive and thrive through a fairly extended dry period. But some of them are very, very frugal with moisture. Barley, pearl, millet, uh, pea, surprisingly Austrian winter pea, the one that we often grow here in wet regions as a winter cover crop, is also quite a good nitrogen fixer uh, and fairly frugal for moisture during the cool season in these semi-arid regions. Um, medic, black medic, it's a relative of alfalfa, but it's shallow rooted and it doesn't uh, soak up the moisture so much. Lentil is another one that's water efficient. Uh, wheat and sorghum sudan are in the middle range and you get into things like radish, which whose praises I sung quite a bit and rye as well. Alfalfa, uh, sanfuin and sunflower. Um, those are all heavy users of moisture. Now you see sunflower in, in uh, the rotation at Philicus Farm. Uh, it's a production crop, so they're getting a, a real value. They're getting a valuable oil seed out of it. Um, okay, next. <clears throat> so um, I've been talking about this farm. There, uh, there are the crab trees um, during kind of a dry season there out in one of their fields, but you see you don't see bare fallow, you see residue, um, even if it's not a time when you got actively growing uh, crops. Uh, and it is, uh, this is not a small farm, it's like 7,400 acres, uh, all managed organically. And uh, they have permanent conservation strips of perennials, na native uh, prairie perennials covering about a quarter of their area. Um, and that probably plays a very important role in both the water uh, relations and also the uh, just overall soil health uh, and, and the uh, uh, whole ecosystem health. One thing I wanted to mention that uh, they use an implement called a blade plow or also a sweep plow undercutter. Uh, the more I learn about this implement, the more I excited I am and more hopeful I am about um, balancing water relations and uh, soil health and the need to make a living in these dry climates. Because what the blade plow does is it undercuts the vegetation, cro cover crops, weeds, whatever you need, to, you need to terminate or control. It just skims along just below the soil surface, disturbing only a couple inches of soil, severing the top from and the, and the crown from the root system, leaving the root system intact to break down 
undisturbed, thereby creating those uh, uh, those micro and macro pores that the soil needs uh, to optimize its water holding capacity. And you leave all that residue on the surface that, that will reduce wind erosion um, and it will um, help conserve any rainfall that falls um, during the course of the season. Uh, so I think that that's, that is a very, um, I have no personal experience doing any kind of dry line farming or gardening, but um, I have learned enough about this implement that if I was out there trying to make a living that way, I would invest in a uh, blade plow right away. Uh, so let's get on to compost, manure, and other organic amendments. Uh, this is another part of organic agriculture that is um, uh, a major player in soil health. Uh, these sources of nutrients, of course, feed the soil as well as the plant. They add, uh, either encourage the development of stable organic matter or add stable organic matter directly as in a finished compost. Um, they can be very beneficial for crop growth, resilience, and yield, as well as water capacity, but more is not always better. If you use a lot of manure or compost that's fairly high in phosphorus, anywhere from a half a percent up, uh, you will easily build up surpluses, and that'll inhibit those valuable mycorrhizal fungi, and you may get some uh, phosphorus runoff into surface water, which you definitely don't want. Another thing is about is nitrogen. Uh, some crops just need huge amounts of nitrogen uh, and on, uh, one of the paradoxes that organic vegetable farmers face is that, um, for example, broccoli, uh, studies in California showed that the economic optimum rate of nitrogen application will exceed uh, 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. In other words, the response of the broccoli and the value of the broccoli on the market at even at $2.50 a pound pays for that organic fertilizer several fold, several times over. And yet, at that application rate, you're leaching substantial amounts of nitrogen to groundwater. And if you get a situation where the soil profile is very uh, very wet, it's above field capacity, excessive rainfall or something for a while, you can also get some of that released as nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. Uh, so something that organic farmers definitely want to avoid. Um, Another thing uh, researchers out west have, have verified that if you build your soil up, like a lot of very intensively managed soil scale organic operations will seek to build up their soil through lots and lots of compost, 10 tons per acre per year or even more. Uh, sometimes a jump start of 20, 30, 40 tons, which that sounds like you're burying the soil, but I'm talking like if you put an inch of compost out you may well be putting down 20, 30, 40 tons per acre. And if you build organic matter levels up high enough, especially if you build it up higher than the um, natural steady state organic matter of topsoil under native vegetation, uh, which would be forest here or prairie out in, uh, in Montana, um, you build up the organic matter higher than that, the soil life will start to mineralize nitrogen faster than your crops are gonna use it. And, and the result is gonna be the same as putting on too much synthetic fertilizer. The nitrogen will leach to the groundwater and you'll have water quality problems. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, a little is great, more is not always better. Okay, I'm just gonna say very briefly, uh, uh, this slide speaks for itself. We all know that weeds steal moisture. So you need to have good weed management. Um, one thing I just wanna quickly point out is that invasive exotic weeds such as Canada thistle, one of the ways that they really harm um, certain rangeland and other agricultural ecosystems, especially in low rainfall environments, is that they have tremendously deep root systems and just like alfalfa, they'll suck the whole soil profile dry. And that's one way that they displace native plants or other desirable plants. Um, there's some others, there's a star thistle, there is a, a spotted knapweed, um, bindweed, um, field bindweed, all of these share that uh, rather um, uh, destructive property. And, and uh, the, the, water you know, the water consumption is only one way in which they, they uh, su supplant others, but it's, um, it's a serious uh, component of that. Okay, and here's uh, what I call the uh, dilemma of organic gardening farming. 
you got to take the weeds out. You're not going to use herbicides, uh, which is a good thing. You're protecting the soil life, of course, uh, and you're allowing yourself to be certified organic by staying away from them. But you got to get out there with something to take the weeds out so they don't overcome that broccoli crop so you cultivate. Now, when you're timing with it and you do it shallow, you're disturbing only a little bit of the soil and you're knocking the weeds out quite effectively. You get them when they're in, sort of in the white. That picture on the lower left, those little tiny white things, those are weed seedlings that you couldn't even see until I uh, went out there with, a, um, uh, uh, with, with my hands and stirred up the soil and uprooted all these weeds that were just coming through. Now, the only problem is uh, sometimes you'll need to cultivate several times. If you've cultivated several times, you've pulverized the very surface aggregates, and then you get one good rain, and you will get that crusting and surface compaction. And so the trick here is to cultivate when you need, but to do everything you can to reduce the number of times you need to do it. So organic weed IPM is um, it's an ecological approach. You just use multiple tactics, good crop rotation. If you rotate your crop so that one year you're growing a warm season uh, production crop and a cold uh, winter cover crop, and then the next year you rotate into cool season cover uh, production crops and a summer cover crop, you keep the weeds mixed up. You don't pre create the same environment every year. Uh, anything you need to, uh, to do to prevent seed set or prevent propagation of those uh, perennial weeds. Um, mulching, of course, is very good. And sometimes you can mow or graze weeds or flame them rather than yanking them out in a way that disturbs the soil. Um, okay, mulching. Um, organic mulches, I, as I mentioned before, they feed the soil and they uh, conserve moisture by slowing evaporation, yet they let rainfall in. Uh, plastic film mulch is widely used by both organic and non-organic uh, producers of vegetables and other horticultural crops. If you've got drip irrigation under them, they can be moisture conserving. Uh, the limitations are that you have this uh, non-degradable product that you're going to pick up every year and throw away, unless you're using a biodegradable mulch, uh, which unfortunately have not yet been approved for um, organic farming um, uh, because they are not totally bio-based. They're partly synthetic, even though they're degradable. So. Uh, organic growers often find themselves having to lay the standard black plastic, which could be picked up at the end of the season. A good alternative is weed mat or um, uh, landscape fabric that has the same uh, weed barrier effects and the same soil warming effects as the black plastic. Uh, but because it's porous, you don't absolutely need uh, drip irrigation underneath. It will let the rain fall in. Um, and the one thing that all of these plastic, uh, all of these mulches do have in common is they will break the force of, of rain or overhead irrigation so that you don't get that surface uh, ponding. However, the non-porous plastic, um, look at that middle picture, imagine a, a rainstorm, a heavy half hour downpour, it's half an inch and half an hour, all that water runs off into the alleys and then you can get erosion, especially if you're even on a two or 3% slope. Next slide. And I apologize, I was not asking you to advance the slides so that you got a little bit out of rhythm there. I apologize for that. It's okay. Okay. Um, tillage. Um, again, uh, this is always a challenge, and you don't have to go total no till to build soil health or to maintain good water relations. There's a number of strategies that can really minimize the adverse effects of tillage. Uh, any kind of tillage at least some residue on the surface uh, is helpful uh, both for continuing to feed soil life near the surface and, and maintain that uh, open structure. Um, ridge tillage or strip tillage uh, leaves the alleys undisturbed and if you have a cover crop they're under residue. The rotary spader is an excellent tool if you need to do full width deep tillage like prepare a seed bed or incorporate a heavy cover crop or um, or even to incorporate a sod at the end of a sod phase in the rotation. Um, it really reduces compaction compared to standard uh, plow disc or rotor till rotary tillage. Um, and it does not pulverize aggregates. Another thing you can do is take a rototiller and just slow it down. Um, there's a grower right, uh, right here in Virginia, Rick Felker, uh, Matt of Woman Creek Farms. He's farming the Eastern shore uh, of Virginia, grows, uh, 
of salad crops and other vegetables, grows a winter cover crop, and uses a bed shaper and a rototiller every year, but he keeps his rototiller on a low PTO speed and increases the tractor forward speed from one mile an hour to two and a half. As a result, instead of pulverizing the soil and beating it to death, the rototiller just gently breaks up uh, the larger clods and uh, leaves visible crumb structure uh, intact, even though he is on a very sandy soil. And again, I mentioned that sweet plow undercutter. Uh, I don't think I need to elaborate because I've already uh, talked about that in some depth. Uh, so a couple of, uh, just a few more slides on um, irrigated systems and high tunnels, and uh, then we'll open up for questions. Um, irrigation, you got to watch the irrigation water quality and uh, because uh, if it's saline or alkaline, it can hurt both crops and soil life. Uh, high levels of sodium in the water can cause soil aggregates to disperse and degrade. Uh, this is an example of a soil that's uh, both poorly drained and saline uh, and sodic, uh, high in sodium. If you have a soil that's already got some of those properties, then it will be particularly vulnerable to the de um, uh, degrading effects of um, low quality irrigation water. Um, if you use more irrigation than you, than you need, of course, you get the water logging. You can also leach nutrients or release nitrous oxide. All of these issues have been documented in research in uh, California uh, and other areas. Um, and one of the things that the Oregon uh, Pacific Northwest Extension say is when you're doing your nitrogen budget, you know, taking into account things like, uh, you know, cover crops and manure, and you also want to estimate how much nitrate nitrogen is added in the irrigation water, which I found rather interesting, but and it's something that's not often thought about. So just quickly, um, irrigation management, if you have overhead irrigation, uh, you will lose some of that moisture to uh, evaporation. It won't be as efficient. And also you have the raindrop impact, which can crust the soil over. Um, In-row drip feeds the crop, not the weeds, highly efficient very gentle on soil structure, but the only drawback is that possibly you may reduce the amount of biological activity and nitrogen mineralization by the soil life if the inter-row areas are left really dry. Uh, I have uh, heard, heard that uh, couple of, from a couple of uh, reputable sources, but on the other hand, um, in most of these ways, the uh, drip irrigation is far more efficient. There was an interesting study on a, uh, by UC Davis with OFRF funding, um, and they work with a farmer, uh, Scott Park of uh, Park Farm Organics. Uh, and uh, uh, the farmer had built up soil quality, so it was quite healthy, had good moisture holding capacity, and he was being to say, gee, I wonder if I need to irrigate my tomatoes as much as I do. So they tried cutting off irrigation two weeks earlier. And that saved like six acre inches, six inches less moisture or 19% uh, reduction in the irrigation that was used, no change in yield. And that's because that deep open soil profile and healthy soil allowed those tomatoes to continue to get enough water to ripen and finish the uh, crop. Uh, berry crops, uh, blueberries are a very interesting crop because they're shallow rooted and they are sensitive both to drought and to excessive water logging. So this is an example of a crop where the precision of in-row drip can be vital. You can just give them just the right amount of water, put them under either an organic mulch or, one, or the uh, weed mat mulch, and uh, that does uh, improve the uh, performance of the crop. Another interesting case of water savings that, that was found by this same research team in Oregon State, that blackberries um, don't need post-harvest irrigation. In fact, if you cut off the irrigation as soon as harvest is done, the vines hardened off better for the winter and you save quite a bit of moisture again. Um, in uh, Utah, uh, one thing I wanna mention is that some orchards maintain the orchard floor bare. They either do that with herbicides or repeated tillage. The idea is to prevent moisture competition with the trees and maximize efficiency of uh, moisture use. Well, that's terrible for soil health. There've been studies that showed compared bare floor orchards um, in various parts of the world, everything from uh, grapes to olives to uh, uh, stone fruit. And basically your soil organic matter drops by half and you don't have anything left of soil health after you 
bear followed that orchard floor for a number of years. Researchers in Utah State showed that if you have it, the alley in a, in a, uh, a legume like uh, bird's foot trefoil, and even right under the trees, the tree rose planted in a shallow rooted uh, uh, living mulch like alyssum, which is a, a small flowering relative of the cabbage family. Um, and then you, when you mow the alleys, you blow the legume clippings into the tree rows. You improve tree health, you improve soil health, and it doesn't use any more moisture than bare fallow. So that was very interesting. And because you're improving soil health, you will be um, enhancing the soil's capacity to hold moisture, and maybe even in the long run, reducing irrigation needs. Okay, well, I'll make one last comment about high tunnels. Um, one thing that it's easy to overlook, but it's very important. You live in a moist environment like I do here in Floyd, Virginia, you put up a high tunnel, well, you've created a semi-arid environment. You just cut off the rainfall. Even if you're irrigating to crop need, um, you will not have that net downward flushing unless you deliberately periodically leach out the salts, either with a, with a heavy overhead irrigation or, or say, Every four years, you gotta take the plastic off. We'll leave it off for a few months, let the, let the rain fall in. Uh, but it's important to monitor that soil, not only for the uh, crop nutrition and soil health issues that can arise in a wet climate, but also the ones that can arise in a dry climate. So test for, test for salts, test for nitrate, um, and very carefully manage nutrient inputs. It's very easy to say, well, this is high value real estate. I'm growing intensively, going three crops a year. I need lots of compost. And you can quickly build up not only phosphorus, but also salts, even with good organic compost. Um, good to test the irrigation water, although you'd think that in a, in a wet, wetter environment, that irrigation water would be as pure as rainwater. Some groundwaters, even in our part of the world, will have significant amounts of salt. So it'd be good to know about that. Um, if at all practical, um, collect roof water from that era, from that high tunnel and use that for some of your irrigation. Uh, okay, I will open up for questions. I want to just thank all of the various sponsors, um, as well as Organic Farming Research Foundation and eOrganic uh, for your support and help me to put this together and get through the glitches that we encountered right before the beginning of the webinar. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, and thanks, Mark. Thanks I ran a little over, but uh, here we are, and I am open for questions. Thank you, Mark. And we have about 30 minutes left for questions. So if you have a question, I know some of you have done this, um, just type them into the Q&A box on your screen. I know some of them, some of them are in the chat box as well. Um, I think I'll ask you to put them in the Q&A box just so I can see most of them in one place. But um, whatever you want to do, we'll get to as many as we possibly can until we run out of time. Um, I just also wanted to mention that we recorded this presentation. So if you missed the beginning, you'll be able to catch it on the eOrganic YouTube channel within one to two weeks. And um, Mark mentioned um, soil health in high tunnels. So I wanted to alert everyone that we have a new webinar scheduled on February 19th called Break Bad Habits, Integrating Crop Diversity into High Tunnel Production Systems by Kerry Rivard of Kansas State University. So if you're interested in that topic, um, you can just Google webinars by eOrganic and you can find all of our upcoming webinars. Um, so moving on to the Q&A here. Um, we had someone that wanted to know if you have a low spot um, that's regularly flooded, is there a way to keep this area healthy? Hmm, good question, low spot. Um, well, if, if you, one thing that might be worth looking into is if you have a different soil type there, if, if your inherent soil properties are simply different, you might want to consider growing uh, some habitat plants there, you know, like create a little tiny wetland, just plant native wetland species, or there may be some useful crop species, uh, you know, medicinal herbs or whatever that thrive on high water table, wetter conditions. Um, if it is simply a matter of topography and perhaps management, like if there's a management induced hard pan that I would grow uh, maybe perhaps cover crop it with something that tolerates some of the moisture. Uh, one crop that comes to mind is Japanese millet. <clears throat> Japanese millet is a tame form of barnyard grass, basically, and if it is uh, terminated before it sets seeds, it will not become a weed. Um, 
and it tolerates wetter conditions and being a millet, being a grass, it will probably help to open up that um, area. Now, if it's off to the edge of the field, there's some way to, to uh, ditch or drain the low area uh, to a non-production area. That's another way that could dry it out. Um, and also you could try a round of radish in there and just open up, see if that, um, if that opens up the uh, subsoil. <clears throat> but it's worth checking your, your web soil survey and see, what, see what's going on there. Okay, um, you mentioned um, high tunnel rainwater catch systems. Um, what does that look like for most people who use them? Um, basically, you have some kind of a gutter system to catch the water coming off of the roof and then it gets routed into a cistern. Uh, and of course the cistern probably would be underground and you'd have to have some way to pump it back up. Uh, there definitely are some logistical challenges with doing this, but it's, I think it's really worth considering. I, I know that at least a few of the NRCS high talls included a roof water catchment system. Uh, I know this has been at least experimented with, I don't know how widely in practice it is. Uh, I don't have the details right at my fingertips. Okay. Um, is the nitrogen mineralization with excess compost that you mentioned predicted or observed? Uh, it's observed. I've observed it myself. I've measured nitrate, nitrogen, and soils that were really highly built up and be up at 150 parts per million. And really, a balanced figure would be down around 25 parts per million for a high, heavy feeding crop and as low as 15 for a lighter feeder. Okay, yeah, and the same person just put in a comment about how cover crops reduce canopy temperature, which is important with increased temperatures. Oh, yeah. Um, the cover crops will, will reduce the soil surface temperature. That's another thing that happens when you have the soil surface exposed. It, it, can be, it can get extremely hot, and that's really hard for the soil life in that top half inch or so. You create a little dead zone there, and that could be another factor in the, in the crusting that can happen. Okay, um, do you know of any tests or results um, that have been done with alternative amendments or mulches such as almond shells, for example? Um, that's the first part of that question. Oh, the question was, I'm sorry, running that by me again? Is it, yeah, do you, uh, have any, do you know of any um, results with alternative amendments or mulches such as almond shells? And I'll ask the second part of the question, which is uh -huh. how does particle size impact the ability of mulch or to retain moisture and immobilize excess nitrogen? Oh, huh, good questions. Um, I've not had experience with these various uh, things. Uh, my feeling is that any organic quote unquote waste that's generated by the food industry or any other industry that is safe to return to the land should get back on the land. On the other hand, um, if you're a mid-sized farmer, you've got a couple hundred acres of corn and soybeans, you've got a hundred acres of vegetables. I don't know how economically feasible it would be to use any of these things. If we're talking garden scale up to a market garden of a couple acres, um, any of these materials work fine. I would, I would think that finely divided stuff, uh, almond shells on down, like rice hulls, things like that. The big issue is not whether they'll absorb moisture, but whether they'll wash or blow away. You get a heavy rain if you've got roll crimped Sudan grass or you spread hay or straw and it's, you've, you, it's got a pretty stable mat so that uh, heavy rain will just soak right in through the straw without moving it. Whereas if you have that same heavy, I've seen this in actually in a, in a uh, field trial of different mulches, we put sawdust mulch down on, on some blueberries. We actually did sawdust, larger wood chip, uh, pine needles, I can't remember what the other one was, hay, I think. And uh, the, where the sawdust was, two things happened. Heavy rains washed away the sawdust and began to erode the soil. And the sawdust being so finely divided indeed tied up nitrogen, and tied it up so much that the blueberry crop was depressed in growth and yield for four years. <laughs> and luckily we did that on a very small experimental basis. So I only ruined about a half a dozen plants of this farmer's <laughs> blueberry planting, but. Yeah, you can tie up with a very finely divided mulch, you can tie up too much nitrogen. And in terms of tying up excess nitrogen, and the, probably the safest, most reliable way to do that is with the living plant. Because not only will that soak it up out of the soil profile, it won't, 
it also won't tie it up so hard that you reduce available nitrogen too low. Okay. Um, do you use mob grazing in rotational pastures? Uh, mob grazing is one version of management intensive rotational grazing. I'm not a grazier. Um, I have never strung a temporary fence or uh, I've only helped build one permanent fence in my entire life for cows and it was just for two cows. So it wasn't a, a mob grazing situation at all. Uh, but I just do know from reading and, and reading up on, and just research, uh, reviewing uh, findings um, of various studies across the country that this overall approach, there are different, there, there are different terms for the same general concept. Uh, I've heard it called holistic resource management, management intensive grazing, mob grazing. Another one is adaptive multi-paddock grazing. It's all based on that overall general principle of brief intense grazing followed by a sufficiently long recovery period. And the exact parameters of how long you graze, how densely you graze, how long do you let it recover varies with region. It also, another thing to consider is what, what um, forages do you plant there? What forages are there naturally? This can be done for everything from native prairie to a planted grass legume mix. Um, all of these particulars are very region specific or even site specific. Um, so I would just go to the nearest source. Like here in Virginia, I would, I would say, you know, talk with Joel Salatin who has done multi-species and multi-paddock grazing very successfully. You wouldn't want to take that exact system and try to transplant it to, let's say, Idaho or New Mexico. You'd rather want to get with some uh, cutting edge ranchers out there, uh, like you're in North Dakota, K Gabe Brown. I just got a book, haven't read it yet. Talks about how he restored the soil with, um, met with livestock. But there are success stories from all over the country. Uh, there was one up in New York State. I can't remember the exact uh, name of the farm. But they monitor the soil organic matter over about 10 years of management intensive rotational grazing. And they added, I think it went one and a half percent. It went from 2.8 to 4.2 percent organic matter. And that's a huge change uh, in soil health, soil organic matter. So yeah, mob grazing uh, is one system or is one term for the general system. Okay, um, can you discuss the difference between stable organic matter and the less stable type, whatever that is called? Hmm. Well, there are so many systems for categorizing organic matter. They're all arbitrary. There's a spectrum. Um, if you just define organic matter as the residues of plant life in the soil, you can have anything from the tasty, juicy sugars and amino acids that come out of roots as root exudate, and their turnover time might be minutes or hours before some microbe says, oh, yummy, and chomps it down. And at the other extreme, you can have organic matter that has been so tightly adsorbed to uh, soil mineral particles, clay minerals, that its turnover time is a thousand years. And in between, you've got this sort of somewhat amorphous category called active organic matter, uh, which is like a slow release nutrient source for your crops because it is eaten by soil life, turned over again by soil life, but more slowly than those fresh exudates. Um, you know, I mentioned the root exudates that would get snapped up immediately. Another, another kind of fresh organic residue might be um, some straw from a crop, you know, uh, corn stover, wheat straw, whatever left in the field, that might turn over in weeks or months. Same with uh, droppings from uh, livestock or applied manure. Um, and then you get various stages of breakdown. And there are other forms of organic matter where rather than being bound chemically to the soil clays and silts, they're physically protected inside of an aggregate, like uh, some partially broken down organic matter. Another important source of organic matter, uh, type of organic matter is the dead remains of the microbes and other soil life itself. When these organisms die, they kind of leave an intermediately active form of organic matter. All these play vi vital roles. Um, and you hear a term called humus. Uh, that is a, um, 
it's not clear that the, the, the jury is out as to whether humus really exists as, as this very complex macromolecule. It may well be a, an artifact of the extraction methods, um, but it has been used as a measure of the stable or organic matter, you know, turnover times of uh, centuries uh, to, to millennia. Uh, but you want, you want the whole uh, gamut. They all have different roles to play. And it's not so much the super stable organic matter itself, but the whole process, you got roots growing in the soil, you got soil organisms, uh, you got fungal filaments, you got the glues coming off of bacteria, um, and you've got this active dynamic process. That is what builds and maintains the kind of open pore structure that you need for the soil to have a high water holding capacity and to remain well drained and aerated at the same time. Uh, so, Complex answer to a, a very good question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, do you know if there's any data anywhere that shows how strong of a hard pan can be penetrated by radish? Um, a soil pepnotrometer, oh, I don't know if I can say this. Soil pepnotrometer <laughs> measures hard pan around 18 inches that requires more than 300 feet. Um, let's see. Yes, I. I can't see this here, but yeah, it requires a certain amount of pressure to penetrate. So. Do you know how strong? That, I would love to see some uh, some real data, but uh, there's certainly evidence that uh, some of these cover crops can punch through 300 psi, which is enough to stop the roots of most more sensitive production crops, like a tomato or a soybean. It gets it reaches 300 psi. I might say that's it, but you get something like sorghum, Sudan grass, or radish on there. And it will probably get through that. I mean, uh, like pearl millet, I, I read some surprising things about pearl millet, that it penetrated not only uh, physical hard pan, but what I, what I call chemical hard pan, it's my own term. Some soils, especially of humid tropical and, and warm temperate regions, including our own here in Virginia, uh, you get down to a certain depth, like in the E horizon or the B horizon, if your soil pH drops below five and a half and there's not much organic matter, you tend to get aluminum becoming soluble. Now, most soils are around five or 10% aluminum. It's one of the most common elements on the planet. And as long as it's in an insoluble form, it's precipitated, it's like a rock, it's not gonna harm anything. But if it becomes solubilized, soluble aluminum is quite toxic to plant roots and it'll stop root growth. So you could have a subsoil that is soft enough to physically penetrate. It will not reach 300 PSI in a penetrometer, but if it is very acid and very um, low in organic matter, which is typical in the subsoil, um, it may have enough aluminum that plant roots won't go. And the really cool thing about pearl millet, and I don't know if it's true of radish or anything or other cover crops, but pearl millet can stand up to both the acidity and the compaction in order to go down five feet and do so effectively enough to mop up excess nitrate to five feet. So uh, there are some, a lot of variability and how well crops uh, can penetrate. And there may be a significant role of the soil uh, microbiome. Like if the plant has a healthy set of microbes to associate with, it increases its overall vigor. And one of those could be its ability to penetrate somewhat hard soil. Okay, so a lot, of, a lot of angles to this. Okay, soil penetrometer, I can say that. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, yeah. That's a good input, but I no, used to not, have one. <laughs> not, not so hard. Okay. So is there an alternative to a moldboard plow for incorporating, incorporating a green manure crop like clover in front of planting corn? I'm trying to minimize damage to soil structure. Oh, wow. I was going to say the spading machine, but I realized that if you're doing five acres of vegetable, a spading machine is exactly the ticket. If you're doing 500 acres of corn, it's a slow operation. I'm not sure if it would work for you, but I'm wondering if you really need to turn that clover. You might try a sweep. I mean, depending upon your environment, you might try the sweep plow undercutter and set it to go about three, four inches deep and sever the clover crown, see if that works. Uh, if you use the moldboard plow uh, and you set it shallow enough that you don't bring up subsoil, you don't want it to go any deeper than say six inches. Um, 
it can be used in a way that is less damaging. Uh, but that is a really good question. It, it, I, again, I'm not a machine um, um, a machinery person, but I've read some very exciting research about both the spading machine and the, the sweet plow undercutter. In fact, there was a study out in Western Nebraska where they compared sweet plow versus disking for terminating a spring cover crop of, I think it was crimson clover and mustard ahead of a summer planting of corn or soybean. And the, uh, the sweet plow improved uh, cash crop yields over no cover, whereas disking in the cover degraded, uh, de reduced the yield of soybean because uh, soil moisture was conserved uh, by the sweet plow and the, uh, the disking just compacted the soil and dried it out faster. Uh, so that was, now again, uh, one of the things about the sweet plow that I learned recently from an extension bulletin that I dug up somewhere from out west, you need to have fairly dry soil conditions. So it may not be uh, the tool of choice in uh, the northeast or the southeast in the spring when things are going to be pretty wet. Okay. Do you have any thoughts about prairie strips to help manage water quality and protect soil resources? Um, I, my first thought is that it was probably dynamite for preventing wind erosion. And if you have fertilized fields and you got prairie strips every now and then, they'll absorb, they will help absorb water and nutrients from any runoff from the fields. Uh, they also create beneficial habitat. If you have, if you're growing, say, corn or wheat, and there might be some pests, if you have those prairie strips, there's a good chance that they will be harboring beneficial insects, keep your pests down. Um, they will also be building, of course, they'll be building the soil quality in those strips. Uh, so one possibility is to rotate every five or 10 years, you know, to move your prairie strips onto some land that's a little tired of growing crops. And then, uh, um, and when you're breaking a sod, very often you do need to use a moldboard plow. Um, and again, just setting it not too deep. So you're almost skim plowing. You're just going like several inches rather than way down into the uh, uh, subsoil. Okay. Um, what methods? Again, would you, uh, I, would, I would have to add oh, a caveat. I really don't. I'm I'm not very familiar with prairie regions, so that may not be the best way to manage a prairie strip. It may be best to have it permanent. Um, but either way, it'll definitely have multiple benefits. And of course, it'll be just be good wildlife habitat. You're going to have all kinds of songbirds and stuff in there that that you wouldn't have if you just had nothing but corn. Okay. Um, if anybody has any thoughts about prairie strips that they'd like to share, um, please feel free to type them into the chat and you can um, send it to all the panelists and attendees. Um, do you know if there, let's see, wait, no, we've, we've done that one. So let me just, oh yeah, okay. What methods would you suggest to prep land in our Northern Virginia red clay? To prepare the land? Mm -hmm. Um, is this like coming out of uh, pasture or just? Let's see, they haven't specified, but if you're still on, um, maybe you can type in a little more information. It says not pasture. Uh-huh. Preparing the land. Uh, well, you know, till as little as you can get away with as much as necessary. Um, red clay is not a bad thing. If it's at the surface, it means that somewhere along the line, some of the topsoil has been lost or the, some of the organic matter has been lost. Um, I mean, right in front of my house, I had a, a garden that was pretty much red clay because it was built on our house, you know, next to our house where there'd been some excavation. And, you know, just grow lots of cover crops, try to keep it covered as much of the time as possible, um, get a soil test and um, use compost at a rate that's compatible with the soil test. Like you want to know where your phosphorus levels are so you don't get them too high. Um, just basic good organic. Um, I have so many times heard people say, well, what can I grow on my red clay? And, you know, just basic good organic soil health building, you know, in three or four years, you're going to have productive soil. Uh, yeah, we have I'd a lot of webinars in this that. series about um, tillage reduction and soil health. So you might want to check back in the archive um, for some of Mark's past presentations that are in the same series. So you'll find them right at the link. 
on your screen. Um, you know, one, one easy way, one easy way to reduce tillage is if you're wanting to build up that soil, you can grow like a late summer cover crop, a mixture of species that'll grow into the fall, but once you really get into heavy winter, it's going to winter kill. And then you'll have this dead residue in place and you won't need very much tillage to get in there in the spring and plant a garden or, or you know, a field crop if you want. Um, another way is if you have some time, just go ahead and plant it to clover, um, mixture of red clover and orchard grass, timothy, you know, any kind of a pasture mix and just keep it that way and uh, maybe run some livestock, <laughs> rotational graze some livestock on it. I mean, if you want to build soil, then you got a few years to do it. Um, a perennial sod phase, uh, a perennial sod period is the best way to do it. But if you have to, if you want to get in there and garden right away, just do a tight rotation, keep it covered, keep it, keep the plants feeding the uh, uh, the soil life, uh, maintain a high diversity, and you will see gradual improvement. And yeah, use compost and use it, you know, a little goes a long way. Compost has a very nice complementary effect on building soil. Um, and by the way, you don't have to get that soil dark brown and, you know, looking like Iowa before it's going to start producing good crops. I've seen some amazingly pretty good looking soil, even though it's still quite reddish. It's just the nature of our soils. Okay, um, I think we have time for one final question here, and here's an interesting one. How soon do we start discussing a national water pipeline similar to our interstate highway system? National pipeline, water pipeline. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, mm. I guess. I think the main thing that. is we need to get the society together to do something about climate change, both at a, at a mitigation level and at a resilience level. Um, after I read about Billica's farms being able to grow 10 or 15 different um, oil seed grain and pulse crops on dry land on 10 to 12 inches a year, I kind of thought, you know, um, there's just so much potential to improve the resilience of our whole system. And anytime you build soil organic matter and soil health, you're doing something about the water issue because you're improving efficiency, you're improving capacity to hold water. And the more we regreen our planet, the more we'll be recycling moisture back into the air in these dry regions and maybe even um, helping to mitigate droughts. I don't know, it's, it's a huge issue, but I, I just have seen enough promise from the organic and soil health research that I think um, that a lot of these problems we can make some real progress on. Um, and I'm not sure that I would go into trying to pipe water from areas of excess rainfall to areas of insufficient rainfall. I just don't, um, I think that's kind of like trying to remove atmospheric carbon dioxide by injecting it into underground caverns. Uh, whereas, you know, I think the living plant holds the answer to a lot of our soil health and some of our climate problems. Um, I can sure relate to the desire to create a water pipeline if it's going to rain 50 inches in Texas and cause a catastrophe while North Dakota is just totally burning up in a horrid drought and they're having to sell their cattle. I can understand um, myself. I've thought about, well, how can you harness the energy in a Category 5 hurricane and use it to light a city for a year rather than <laughs> destroy the city? But... Um, I keep coming back to the living plant and good farming practices as a lot of what's going to help solve some of these big problems. Okay, well with that, thank you everyone for all the questions. And um, as I mentioned, you'll be able to find the recording of this and our other webinars in this series on the eOrganic YouTube channel, as well as in our webinar archive. And this one will be available within one to two weeks. And we'd also be very grateful if you could fill out the uh, follow-up email survey that will be arriving later today. So thank you so much, Mark. And we hope you You're can welcome. all join us for the other webinars in the series. And you can find those by just typing webinars by eOrganic into a search engine. So thanks, everyone, and Mark. Yeah, thank you.